Hello. I am so tired. <laughs> there were ideas popping up and rebounding on the walls of the room. It was just incredible. So we uh, did our exercise and found different themes. Uh, the themes were tipping points, variability, altered biodiversity, models and AI, interaction network, state of knowledge, society. And we focused on one that originally was called Star Trek, which was novel approaches to mitigating climate change. Uh, because, because it's the way it went, we focused on geoengineering, even though there were lots of sticky talking about a lot of other uh, possibilities, ocean fertilization, genetic engineering, SRM. Um, and then we did the why, the five whys. This was really complicated because big conversation discussions were going on and a few people had more ideas than others. They, it became very, very um, philosophical. We also, we also focused on um, this particular theme because we wanted to go into a, a theme that had not been really discussed so far and that is unusual for some, some of us scientists to really focus on. So, it was a hazard associated Correct. That's right. Yes, the Star Trek scenario. So uh, once we had all the whys, and we, I took a lot of notes, and there were very, very many ideas. But we came up with opportunities, barriers, and uncertainty for um, those various whys we discussed. So opportunities, um, using a novel approach helps hopefully, to change worldview. That's the hope that people developing these approaches have. It also helps avoid emergency thinking, which sometimes doesn't give enough time to give sustainable solutions. It, it helps enjoying co-benefits. For example, if we fix climate change, um, we could also reduce pollution, reference to a famous uh, cartoon about this. Um, we could also shift to adaptive man management, which is also the holy grail for all the managers that I know, at least in the Forest Service here in the U.S. And this is the lack of portfolio ap approach. Actually, the opportunity is to have a portfolio approach. And the barrier is that often we don't have this, this type of approach. Uh, the barriers are inertia, the lack of alternatives uh, available to us today, inequality among, in society, Egocentrism, the addiction to technofix and self-sustaining um, movement towards um, using always a solution, a technological solution. And the, bar the barrier is, of course, uh, social justice. Um, area of uncertainty is popularism, um, resource allocation, effectiveness. There should be an E there, but anyway. And uh, the effectiveness of the method that we would be chosen and the technology solidarity. So um, I want to thank Valerie for taking notes because this was a really tough se session. And um, the people who were in that particular discussion room were Rebecca, Sandra, Clifford, Alex, Tim, Yetvinder, Richard, Stefan, Martin, and Park. And so um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to let the rest of the group answer them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's a very great question. <laughs> 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 what we'll do is touch that specific point of clarification now, but a broader discussion will have at the end. It's just one or two minutes of clarification rather than discussion to repeat. Okay, yeah. in which case, let's move on to another uh, meetup. Well, that was predictably hard, um, but I think we got somewhere in the end. Um, so we, uh, we came up with a whole di diversity of ideas, as I'm sure everyone else did, and then we honed in on, on uh, these two clusters. So the first challenge was about um, 
social inequity of impacts and of solutions. Um, so more of a, a social facing challenge. And the second was um, that solutions to one problem can create challenges to solving other problems, so unintended consequences. And we were thinking more about the ecosystem in that context. So the first challenge, uh, we, we, we got a bit, a bit lost on the whys. We, we, kind of, we weren't really going in a linear fashion. We were going all over the place. Uh, so, so, and, and, but these are some of the thoughts that we came up uh, with around, around this challenge. So it's being driven by uh, issues such as inequality of distribution of wealth and power. So wealthy countries, for example, um, uh, um, having all the, all the power. Uh, elite capture of solutions. So um, solutions are often, uh, the benefits often go to the uh, people locally with, uh, with power. Um, um, externalizing of, of impacts among nations or, or, or within nations. Um, faulty price systems, distributed impacts, um, a lack of political will and regulation a lack of empowerment, and then problems with knowledge, data, and tools. We then moved on to the second challenge, and what we first tried to do was um, uh, use, a, use a concrete example. So we, we, we talked for quite some time around um, the unintended consequences of uh, reducing meat consumption, and, and, uh, and then we came back to thinking about this as a whole. So the potential opportunities we came up with uh, were firstly to identify general principles for when and how to consider complexity to avoid unintended consequences elsewhere, um, how to improve coordination between experts uh, and people in different geographies to try and do this uh, at very large scales, and, and to in engage uh, other disciplines. So we're thinking about particularly in this forum, it's heavily dominated towards the natural sciences. And the challenges and barriers, it's very hard. Um, it requires um, a global scale analyses, um, and often that means uh, simplifying parameters and losing a lot of information, and, and also that the, the resolution uh, of, of the data is, is potentially not there. So that's where we got to. Okay. No, they, this was really th thinking in general. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next group. Okay, well, we had a very, uh, very wide-ranging discussion at first, as I'm sure everybody did. Many, many post-its. Uh, it took a while to kind of engage into something more specific, but where we started working was on the issue of prioritization, specifically the fact that everyone comes at this problem from a slightly different perspective in terms of, even within conservation, value in charismatic species, climate itself, um, traditional lifestyle, you know, there's so many different values that, and nearly every strategy for dealing with climate change has some sort of trade-offs, as has been emphasized today. And, uh, so, and that's even within conservation and climate change adaptation, let alone all the societal values beyond that. So we've kind of started on a tangent of, well, let's talk about prioritization and maybe better tools for quantifying the trade-offs. And then we kind of got into more of a sense of, we already have enough information about that, or maybe that's not the most important area. It was suggested, I think this is a really great suggestion, that we focus more on this kind of new paradigm that apparently has emerged pretty recently. To admit, I had never heard the term negative emissions before today, but I guess this is this new paradigm that says we have to ask, act fast and use the biosphere as a major source of climate engineering, plant a lot of trees, uh, do a lot of soil restoration, but mainly plant a lot of trees. And late in our discussion, it was also brought up that blue carbon is 
almost perfectly analogous in every way. All the challenges and opportunities that pertain to afforestation also pertain to blue carbon, i.e., you know, doing the same sorts of things in marine and freshwater systems. So we broadened our um, we broadened our opportunity from large-scale terrestrial carbon sequestration to large-scale terrestrial and marine and aquatic, i.e., blue carbon sequestration, so that we could then kind of sink our teeth into some relatively specific challenges, barriers, and uncertainties. And boy, did we ever find a lot of them, especially challenges and barriers. Um, with forest, afforestation, there's the question of, um, is this going to be all about monocultures? Oh. Is, sorry, is this going to be all about monocultures, uh, which means that, that they'll be uh, potentially vulnerable to disease and other sorts of uh, changes? Uh, will planting a forest, whether it's more re in a restoration sense or an afforestation sense, how much will it harm both the producers of food and the production of food uh, for people? Uh, how much will it either positively or negatively affect biodiversity? Again, depending on whether it's more restoration or afforestation type of activity, what sort of species are used. There may be some just physical problems and barriers, such as degraded lands being targeted for this activity, and they may turn out to be too degraded to support forests. There's the problem of disturbances, particularly fire and hurricanes that are expected to become more frequent and may wreck the potential to store carbon in land or sea. Then there's kind of more political, social uh, problems, like how do you set up both systems of payment uh, to reward people for doing these activities and systems of governance to make sure that they're done properly and maintained properly. And then all the equity problems of uh, the unequal distributions of costs and benefits. So no shortage of challenges and barriers. And then some areas of uncertainty, we tried as much as possible to focus on things to which and at least in theory, you know, information-rich answers could be found. Are there ways to manage the financial risk? We didn't talk about that, too, that one too much, but it was thrown out as one area of uncertainty. The context dependency, and this can be both the social, political, and ecological context dependency. How well is this going to work in different ecological settings? How much carbon is going to be stored? How vulnerable uh, will the stored carbon be? And so on. And how much will it contribute to global carbon storage? There's a ton of, ton of technical uncertainties there, which we could all devote the rest of our careers to. Uh, then, of course, we talked about the political risks, the potential that pursuing these kinds of activities might feed into some sort of a you know, populist backlash of the kind that we've uh, seen in some countries not to be named here. Uh, and then also uh, just kind of the, what are the limits, the kind of the ecological limits of this strategy? Can it play out fast enough to make a difference? And how quickly will biodiversity be able to sort of adjust itself to large scale uh, activities of this kind uh, if they are carried out? Questions? All right. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, like all the others, we had a very interesting discussion. And this is really just to show the sort of, uh, I guess, initial chaos in terms of all the different ideas that we presented on the board. But we did manage to get them all together, and we identified probably five or six different areas. I think the biggest challenge we had, actually, was keeping the post-its on the board, because they kept yeah. on falling off. But anyway, we managed to keep them on there. And uh, what we did was we spent quite a bit of time deciding on what we would focus on. We identified two uh, we wanted to talk about engagement as one area, but the other area which we started working on was tipping points and also multiple stressors. So we were really thinking about the idea that multiple stressors can actually lead to tipping points and abrupt changes in ecosystems. So we decided to actually merge them together. Um, like was mentioned with one of the other groups, we, we did the five whys process, and it's quite interesting because right at the end, uh, the last one we came up with was that we think in a linear manner. But the process that we had, as uh, was mentioned by Nick previously, was incredibly non-linear. In as we went through all these different areas, we were essentially just bringing different ideas together. So there wasn't really much flow between the whys. But having said that, I think it worked very well to take us to uh, the different areas, opportunities, barriers. 
And to take it to the next slide, is there? So this is basically what we came up with. Um, so we're focusing here on tipping points in particular and multiple stressors. And we identify potential barriers, um, potential opportunities, and areas of uncertainties. And these were all things that cropped up within our five whys. And I guess just to highlight a few of them, I won't go through all of them. You can see we've come up with more barriers than uh, opportunities or areas of uncertainty. But just to highlight a few which I think are particularly important or the group felt were particularly important. And if you start with opportunities, I think one of the important points that was made is the second point here, is that there was a need to move away from a focus on targets and mitigation and a focus more on human well-being. So we're looking more at ways that changes can actually have a positive impact on society rather than focusing on actual targets, mitigation targets, etc. And the other thing which I think was particularly important in this discussion are these last two points in that we also thought that uncertainty was something that people struggle with dealing with, but we discussed quite a lot about how we can actually use uncertainty in a positive way. And just to give an example, at the end there, we were talking quite a lot about how we can use tipping points, for example, to actually force shifts in systems that could actually be desirable. So we were talking about the whole area of uncertainty and how we actually can use uncertainty in a positive way rather than in a way which actually brings fear and concern among the general public and also among scientists. So I guess the key point there was really sort of a shift in the way that we actually think about uncertainty, a shift in the way that we think about meeting mitigation targets and really sort of a move more to the social side rather than to actually quantifying, etc. Now, as you see, in terms of barriers, we've got rather a lot there. There were some commonalities with some of the barriers that were measured previously. I think right at the top, there were two really important ones, and there was institutional and government inertia. Uh, there was the nation state and the difficulty of acting globally. And I think um, Chris talked about this this morning in his example in Spain, the fact that it's very difficult to actually address issues based because of things like governmental borders, et cetera, and regional borders. The other thing that was um, picked up here was also the need for people to actually embrace uncertainty again, uh, which we saw as a barrier. It's also an opportunity, but also a barrier. And also the need for new modeling approaches or the lack of modeling approaches can actually deal with this kind of uncertainty. And one I actually added to it myself when uh, the others had left the room at the end, so just as uh, uh, for my own interest, is I thought also that the actual technology in many cases to actually measure temporal dynamics and responses is just not available. So if you're looking at systems, for example, microbial systems, it's very difficult to actually look at the temporal dynamics of some of these systems to actually identify shifts in those states because of the level of technology required. The other thing right at the end was not representing environment in economic intelligence, which was also a key barrier identified. So finally, on areas of uncertainty, um, the big one, I think, um, it's fair to say, my group can shout out if they disagree, was this top one, which was about communicating across disciplines and sectors, in that we thought that that was a key area in terms of how we can actually deal with tipping points, in that it requires a socio-ecological, socio-economic approaches, and as has been mentioned previously, we often work in our own discipline areas, which makes it very difficult to approach these problems. The other area that we mentioned, just to highlight a couple, is the actual metrics and measurements to actually detect early warning signs. Because again, we heard this morning, many of the examples that we have of tipping points or shifts are things that have already occurred. So the question remains really about research to actually identify those early warning signs in different systems and at different scales to detect in advance and potentially mitigate those abrupt changes in ecosystems. And then the very final thing we mentioned there was the actual modeling approaches of complex systems. And that was a really a key theme, I guess, that went through the whole discussion about the need for a more systems type approach to measuring the complexity of these kinds of systems. And I think that hopefully covers all the main points that we covered in our group.
Yeah, Advinda, can I make an observation just on, just based on these four pieces of feedback? It's really striking how, I mean, this is just one example. So many of them have come back and talked about social, political, institutional questions, the kind of challenges of these cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral conversations. Um, and that seems to be really interesting, because the moment you go beyond your third why, you're sort of, I think, ending up at, at some of these sort of larger societal constraints. Rather, it's, it takes us beyond the realm of the technical and the scientific in a narrow sense and takes us into these much larger institutional questions. So I, I, I don't know, just an observation. Just I was in one subgroup, but it's interesting that all four groups actually ended up in that realm of discussion, yeah, which, which, is, which is really quite, quite interesting just an, as an observation. Yeah, that, that's a very uh, astute point. Uh, and I think it's a common theme that, that's emerged for the day that you know, we've seen the potential for using ecosystems for mitigation or adaptation, and often the reason when a why hasn't, if it's so wonderful, why hasn't it happened already? And the reasons are often barriers at different scales, from the very local to the institutional to, to the national, uh, in terms of institutions and, and structures. So I think uh, that's a key thing uh, to, to identify. How can we identify those barriers and overcome come those barriers? Any other uh, thoughts or, or comments? Yeah, I just wondered if we're all happy with um, what we know about ecosystems, because because it is true that uh, a lot of what we're talking about, what needs to be done, is you know to engage social sciences and to really you know try to expand out in the in the in the way that Bhaskar was just talking about. But um, I didn't hear a lot of this is what we really need in terms of ecosystem research. And maybe that's okay. I mean, I work in the former area, so, um, but, but I wonder, if, because it, it, it often happens in these kinds of discussions that it does come around to those, those larger challenges that uh, we aren't really expert at. <laughs> so, so, there's, so I'm just putting it out there. Are you guys happy with what we know about ecosystems? Okay, and that's raised a few hands, so that's great. <laughs> okay, uh, so Pete? Yeah, I'd say that we, that we obviously would like to know more, but we shouldn't let that paralyze us in moving forward. So we know enough to move forward and to make the right decisions in a sort of a no regrets way, while still working out the fine details. So I'd say it's a bit of both. And that also draws on a point I made earlier today about things are changing so fast that some things, you know, obviously, we need to improve our understanding and know more, but we also need to act in the context of uncertainty and imperfect understanding, because that's always where we're going to be uh, over this century. Did the other, there are some other hands up there still. Uh, so Daniela? We had a very similar question of, you know, how much knowledge do we need to have to be able to act? But actually, what we concluded is that we need to act now because we can't wait until we have reached that knowledge of you know, every ecosystem and every species and every process and every interaction. Where in the discussion we've had in a smaller group, we, we thought much more about you know, the, the, not the individual species responses, but the networks, the food webs, the, the larger systems where we really lack. And you know, if you think of Richard's talk of you know, what we all can't do but desperately know to, to, need to know to implement some of these actions in an efficient way. And I guess that's where it comes much more to. Because we could go on forever trying to you know, characterize every physiological process. But by that point, there's nothing to protect. OK, uh, it was uh, Chris. You know, I think there's a really interesting contrast between what's a compelling science question to advance the state of knowledge and, and what's a path forward in developing solutions. And, and I think that totally agree with the comments that have already been made that we, we know enough to act. But I would argue that we don't know enough about um, managing the progression of those actions and how we learn from experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think my answer to Nancy's question is that we, we really don't have the scholarship foundation 
to um, a adaptively manage in a world where we're tackling the environmental issues that underlie the t this meeting over today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, was Tim, did you have a point? I, I did, but I just got left fielded by Chris there because did you just say we don't have the knowledge to adaptively manage the world or something like that? Because my, understand, my understanding of adaptive management as a paradigm is it's predicated on the fact that we don't understand the complex system and we have a humility in how we approach it, but we try to learn about it by intervening and then being sensitive to the consequences of our intervention and then adjusting our actions accordingly. So philosophically, I'm getting confused because that's my understanding of adaptive management and why it's kind of a, an appropriate paradigm given what we've just been discussing about levels of humility and uncertainty in understanding these complex systems. Because kind of to come back to the, the other point around, I mean, as a, someone who works in the climate sphere as well, it's sometimes used as, shall we say, almost like an intellectual weapon by the climate crowd that we can predict the climate. We know what the equations of fluid dynamics are. These ecologists over there don't know what the equations are, you know. But actually that can be turned to a strength, I think. But it really does depend then on the paradigm for action, crucially. You need a paradigm for action that is, is built on and embraces that humility of we don't fully understand the complex system, but we can't not act. I mean, I, I think that yeah, may I respond to that? Yes. I think we're really saying sort of the same thing. I, I would argue that we have not invested anywhere near uh, sufficient scholarship in figuring out how to do the adaptive management, how to, right. how to act with humility in a way that allows us to learn from doing. I, I think that we have the core uh, foundations. I, I think we have more than sufficient knowledge to act. but. The actual scholarship on adaptive management yeah. is very limited. It is. It is. Mm. Okay, I'll take a couple of points. Uh, as Chris, um, in terms of adaptive management, the problem is we, as those of us who are scientists, can say something, admittedly with limited knowledge, but something reasonable about how you might reach a certain point and um, what the bounds of possibilities are. Some things under the new climate, for example, are simply not options that are in front of us, whereas the, but there are many different options which are available for the future. And the problem I think that a lot of we're running into and the reason we're talking about social science and arts and humanities and the needs for wider um, conversations is because there actually isn't a consensus about which of a number of options which actually are available to us in terms of directions of which ones we really want to head for. And, and, and once we've decided on that, then a scientist and the groups of others can, can try and work out what are the best ways to get to that point or move in that direction as a moving target. But, but I think there's a lot of scientists who've got some level of understanding of something, but we're a bit flummoxed when it comes to then what people actually want. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to add to that uh, comment about adapt or the series of comments about adaptive management in my graduate conservation biology class that I used to teach, I must have had I don't know how many leading agency scientists from different state and federal agencies, since Davis is conveniently close to the state capitol, come and talk, and I would say, please give me a concrete example of the adaptive management that your agency is doing. And what you get are these flowcharts, of course, that show how adaptive management is supposed to work. Then when it comes to the part where you take in information and then change the management in response to that new information, what you find is that the decision itself was originally a compromise between warring interest groups. Do you log the forest or do you save it for owls? You take years to hammer out that one compromise solution. You're not going to change that because of some new bit of data. Because then you'd have to go back to 10 years of public meetings and lawsuits. I mean, literally, the, 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 point, the, the problem is not that we don't know how to do adaptive management, is that we can't do it because we're bogged down by the conflictual political process, which is, I don't know how you solved that problem, but it was pretty clear that that's what the problem was. OK. OK, that's good. Uh, great. Uh, uh, 
That's very, some really good points there that I'll take down.